Yeah, that's how people get bit. And whether it's a dog this side, it's so goofy and funny when they're aggressive. Um, it's not because no. they can bite you. No. And it still hurts. Hey guys, welcome hey. back to the podcast. We brought our chihuahuas today. <laughs> So who knows what to expect? Yes, this is um, the trash puppy that was found mm -hmm. in a dumpster. So you can kind of tell. <laughs> and this is the dog that cost me multiple thousand dollars from a ethical breeder. So paid, we have both ends yes, of the spectrum here. Zero ninety nine for you. <laughs> and look at him, a gem. We love him. Come here. What is this pose? Do you see this? <laughs> um, get comfy, guys. Let's um, <laughs> let's so settle cute. in. Oh my gosh! Wow. Um. Anywho, we were inspired to bring our chihuahuas today because we were going to talk about uh, season one, episode one of the Dog Whisperer because it was entitled Demon Chihuahua. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Was the dog's name Nunu? Yes. That's actually a pretty cute name. We call Nelson that Nunu. Um. But. Caesar Milan, what what is it originally called? The Dog Whisperer. The Dog Whisperer. Um, mm -hmm. Wild Time. Wild mm -hmm. Time. Honestly, uh, so there was a couple of points from watching that segment, specifically with the Chihuahua, that I wanted to bring up because the to highlight the culture change yes. that has happened around dogs. Because yes. when the Dog Whisperer came out, nobody thought yeah. anything of it. Nobody blinked no. an eye. If anything, we were like, this is amazing. We're like, he can talk to animals like Eliza Thornberry. Yeah. Like. <laughs> but in, I preface all this by saying like, I think Caesar's great. Yes. I really like Caesar. Um, I, my only like, not even a criticism, but my, my hot take, I guess, with Caesar is that I just don't think his techniques translate well to no. like the general public because his whole philosophy hinges on you having the ability mm -hmm. to like channel your emotions and your energy and just have like an innate way with animals. Yes. And not everybody can do that. Yes. Um, so it doesn't translate well, I think, to the general public. But I think he's incredibly gifted with yeah. animals. He has just like a natural gift. He's like, like, I don't compare the dog daddy to Caesar, but like the dog daddy's almost like a modern Caesar, but like kind 10 of. times more, I think, adversive. But well, and I think Dog Daddy like thrives off the controversy, yes. which is what makes him very yeah. different. Like he he wants that and he wants to be like this big social media star. Like, yeah, Caesar genuinely, I think, just like had a, a passion and a knack for working with dogs. Mm. And then it just kind of like blossomed from there. But yeah, I think okay. he just has like a knack for it. I don't think that he thrived off of like, he didn't want controversy. He was just like, no. this is the most logical way to deal with dogs. Yeah. So I do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where I think that's the big difference with I dog daddy. It came out in 2005. The first episode aired, which I was like, math is math. And, but I was like 12, maybe in 2005. Oh yeah. I was too, actually. And I was like watching it and I was, I thought it was the greatest show of all time. And I was like, I want to be him when I'm mm -hmm. older. And it really is like some of the episodes are so intense. Yeah. And it could never survive in today's world. Oh, no. People, I mean, people are up in arms about it and it's not even like actively yes. going on. And if you, it's sad because if you watch some of his more modern shows that are still happening, you can tell they're very watered down. Yes. Yeah. And not that I think he does anything different. I think that they just don't show yes. the like real raw reality of it a lot of times, which Those is a bummer. Days, like the Caesar Milan days and how things like that one episode where there was that massive pit bull fight. Oh yeah. That yeah. was crazy that they showed that. They, and they showed <laughs> a lot of it. They did. And it was a multi -dog You could see fight. blood, lots of blood. Um, but one of the big culture shifts that I wanted to point out was, so there's with the Chihuahua, basically the Chihuahua like guards the mom typical yes. chihuahua problem that like mm. commonly happens and so he goes and he sits on the couch next to her 
and he's next to her and she tell he tells her to like pick up the dog and put it right on his lap mm-hmm. yeah. so she does that and then he's petting the dog and, the, and the dog like starts fine yeah fine at, at first. first and then it panics <laughs> yeah <laughs> And it starts like attacking him and going absolutely berserk. And he's just holding it down. Um, And she gets like very emotional and upset, but she's emotional and upset. He asks her, he's like, what's going on? And she says, I just never wanted to have a dog that would do this to people. Yes. And that was such a drastic difference from, I think how that conversation would go these Mm. days, because most people would look at that and be like, poor dog. He's terrorizing the dog. The dog is so scared. Oh my gosh. I can't believe he would do that to the dog Mm -hmm. when it should be like what she said, which is why training like that was more widely accepted, real effective training because people cared more about people than their dog than they do their dogs, which is an extremely important beginning placeholder that we mm. should have foundationally people come first and i can smell the comments already about yeah. like people don't come first dogs come first i like my dog more than any person i've ever met my okay that's weird me there's something wrong with you yeah that's weird so like the way that caesar d- did things like i remember just having a lot of respect for him as like a child yeah and like again it was such a different time oh yeah like completely different. Some of it is like some of those episodes are very rough. Yes. And like I because I grew up watching his stuff, too, because like you said we were really young and I grew up training horses and everything. And a lot of the concepts with training horses and dogs is there's a lot of overlap. Mm-hmm. The general motivation for why the animals do what they do is different because one's prey and one's predator. But a lot of the concepts like pressure and release are yeah. very similar. And that's like. Essentially, with that chihuahua, what he was doing, the mm-hmm. pressure did not release until you gave me yes. the behavior that I was looking for, which was to stop trying to attack me. Yes. And it's funny that I look back at it now when you re um, brought it up and I watched it. That's literally what I did in a first lesson with a dachshund, mm. Finn, that one yeah. that's come a couple times for boarding and daycare. One um his whole first lesson and i was really bummed Paige, because i was like this would have been such a good one to film um i know it's always the ones that you're not there for that i'm like that would have been a good one but i he was a jerk and he was a brat Mm -hmm. and you could say oh but he's just scared okay you can't bite people no like that's that's just not okay so i took him away from his mom he's panicking we had to get some of the leashes on him and do all that kind of stuff so there's no way around it and again you could look at that situation and be like you're flooding him yeah you're putting him over threshold you need to be okay but guess what after that first lesson he never tried to bite Mm -hmm. anyone ever again yeah because i nipped it in the bud right away are dogs flooding us like when they people come into our what house about us, what guys? About us? <laughs> and like that little chihuahua new new like they couldn't have people over they couldn't have people sit on the couch they mm-hmm. couldn't have people go and hug her and these are just things that people naturally do so people that aren't used to dogs when they come into a house with a dog like that they're not going to be careful no and they and shouldn't have people, to be yeah that's how people get bit and whether it's a dog this side it's so goofy and funny when they're aggressive um it's not because they can bite you no and it still hurts yeah and they can still cause damage especially to like children yes like yes snoop is not going to kill anyone he's not going to cause harm to an adult really substantially but if he nailed a kid right in the face Mm -hmm. you could do a lot of damage physically but not to mention like psychologically yes like that is a huge big difference and again to clarify because again i can already hear the the comments for this too in the same way that we won't accept dangerous behaviors from our dogs, we advocate for our dogs to be treated with respect yes. as well, but within reason. So like you said, people should be able to come in your house and behave like people. Mm-hmm. Kids should be able to live in your home and behave like a child. They should be able to run around. They should be able to swing their legs on the couch. They mm-hmm. should be able to. I actually just had a client message me and it's hilarious because I haven't seen her in years um since i've trained her dog 
but she'll always check in with me every once in a while. And when I see messages come from her, I know they're going to be hilarious mm-hmm. stories because she always sends me video, or like little stories of how like appalled she is yeah. at other people and their dog's behavior. <laughs> but she gave me like uh, basically like a scenario where she was like, we were at like a dinner party um and somebody had brought their dog who doesn't even live there mm-hmm. okay and she's like i literally had to make my child sit on the couch the entire time because mm-hmm. if he got off the couch the dog would aggressively try to mount and hump him and was like nipping at his hands mm-hmm. and chasing him around she's like this dog climbed on the table at one point and was like eating everyone's food like just mm-hmm. a complete menace and i was like And she's like, and I was put in a weird position because like now I'm almost mad at my kid Mm -hmm. because he's not listening because he won't stay on the couch. But like, that's not fair to him because he's a human. He should be able to walk around (laughs) and do normal behaviors without being harassed by somebody's terribly behaved dog. And we like get so used to tiptoeing around our dogs rather than like actually solving the issue or working on the problems that our dogs are displaying when guests come over. Like it should not be that the dogs have to work or we have to work into the dog's life. Mm -hmm. The dog needs to work into our life. Yes. So whether when you have guests over, your dog needs to be crated or, you know, you do a bed stay, you do some training. If they can be out, great, good for you. But you have to be able to manage your dog somehow. Yep. And and back to my original point that I never got to because I went on a little rabbit trail was... Obviously, within reason, like people should be able to exist around your dog. But then and people, I mean, are would be the first to say, like, even with Snoop, like I'm very protective over like I don't let people pick him up. Mm-hmm. I don't let people get in his face because I know he doesn't like it. Yeah. And so to me, I'm like, I don't want to continually have humans crossing his boundaries and put him in a position that then one day if somebody does pick him up his threshold has dropped so low Mm. because he's so sick of it that he growls at them or snaps at them. I don't want to put him in a position to be able to do that. And so in the same respect that I wouldn't tolerate those behaviors from him in an inappropriate context, I never want to put him in a position where he feels like his boundaries are being crossed repeatedly. And you can almost like condition a dog into, you can condition a dog into like if you touch too much and they don't like it, their natural response when they see a human is to be really reactive and they're mm-hmm. preemptively like get the hell away from me. I don't like this. Yep. And we allow and we allow and we allow that. Yep. Tom learned what appeasement kisses were yeah. through Snoop Yeah. because he was like, but he's kissing me. I'm like, Tom, he's kissing you to appease you. Mm-hmm. Like he doesn't, he doesn't want you in his face right yeah. now. And he's like, oh, I didn't know dogs did that. It's like one of, the, when they're like, yes yeah where they're like avoiding eye contact Mm. and they're just like doing it to be like okay if i do this will you Mm. leave me alone like trying to get you to stop i told a story on my instagram the other day where i can kiss all of my dogs and they enjoy it they like it they come up to me and seek that out but i have one dog that if i kissed him on the face i could not guarantee that he wouldn't bite me and like tear into my flesh work (laughs) yeah he's so unstable like if you're picking him up and kissing him. Like the second you put him down, he's like, ah! <laughs> and all of the energy just comes at the end of the interaction because he's like, so like stiff. Yeah. It's like pent up that whole yes. time. And then it just like explodes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I don't kiss him because he doesn't like it. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. Imagine that. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And again, that is a reasonable boundary. Mm-hmm. Reasonable. Yeah. A reasonable boundary. So, and like with, Snoop, again, my goal is that because we're very respectful of his boundaries, if you cross the boundary every once in a while, he's going to be more likely to tolerate it because we haven't worn his patience down mm-hmm. to like, you know, and a he, feather at he that says, point. says, mom's got my back. Like, mm-hmm. he can trust in your ability to advocate for him so he can lead with being more friendly because yeah. he knows that ultimately you're going to step in and be like, don't pick him up. Yep. Don't kiss him on the face. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's where you can't be like worried about hurting someone's feelings. Mm -hmm. You have to just advocate for your dog and be nice and firm with them. Yes. Like even um, Julia today. 
Mm-hmm. She like called him over and then immediately picked him up. And I said, if you keep doing that, he's not going to come to you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I said, because he hates being picked up. Mm-hmm. And she did the same thing. She's like, look, he's kissing me. I said, Julia, he's not happy right now. Yeah. And she's like, fine. <laughs> Put him back down. <laughs> but he's just an independent little guy. Yes. He likes his space. Yeah. He doesn't like to be physically manipulated. Like when I even picked him up to carry him downstairs to come here, I was it was literally like holding a live fish. Mm-hmm. Like he's like, <laughs> we had a live one. Hi, bud. Yeah, I think, like, going back to the show, that, that first episode, and just, like, Caesar's work in general, is, like, again, it would never survive today as audiences, but people back then literally thought he had he could communicate with animals, like, yeah. telepathically. Yes. That he just had this way about him, and you couldn't just, be, like, recreate that. You had to be him. Yeah. And he really just used techniques where he was dominant. Mm -hmm. And he said... Dominance exists, guys. It really does. But people always, like, think, oh, like, he is such a positive trainer. Like, he does this. And then, like, I hate to tell you this. (laughs) I feel like there's either people that think that Caesar's, like, a joke and, like, isn't effective at all. Or there's people that think he's, like so like over the top like compulsive Mm -hmm. like terrible yes like those are i feel like the two extremes with him yeah but he just relies a lot on negative reinforcement yes does he use e-collar he has he has yeah Yeah, he's he has used e-collar at least to my my knowledge the only time i've seen him use one in like a show was with the dog that would attack livestock okay he used an e-collar for that yeah. Which makes sense. Mm-hmm. That would be very effective. Uh, but yeah, he used it for that. But I've never seen him use it in a context. Like he's only ever used it, I think, for like to stop behaviors. Yes. Yeah. I don't think he Not uses it in like an obedience context or anything like that. I think a lot of his show focuses on stopping unwanted behaviors rather than yes. teaching the dog anything. And it's people that have struggled with their dogs. It's always an emotional episode. Mm -hmm. They can't have people over. They can't do this. They can't do that because they're letting their dog dictate their life. Yes. Um, And it makes excellent content. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, I mean, it's accurate. The stuff he does works. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't deny that it works. The other uh, story in that first episode was the big Great Dane that like mm-hmm. wouldn't go back into the school. Yeah, the floors. Yeah, yeah. Because he, so she used to take her Great Dane to the school that she worked in, and one day he was like running down the hallway and he slipped, and he like slammed into the wall mm-hmm. or something, and she made like this huge big deal about it and immediately left with him, and then from then on he refused to walk mm-hmm. back into the school. She couldn't get him to go back in, and sees. <laughs> Caesar literally put a slip lead on him mm-hmm. and was running full speed with him up the stairs and into the doorway and just yanked him right mm-hmm. inside and just used his momentum to get him in. And then the they kept doing that. And then I, I found it pretty funny because once then they got the dog to willingly continue walking in, that dog looked terrified mm-hmm. still. D- head down, tail was tucked down, like very sad. But the owner was like, finally, Mm -hmm. he's back in the school. And then you could see like they did like a check in later on and he was like back to his normal self. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, how many people would look at that and be like, we need to use positive reinforcement and get him closer and closer and closer. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to build up over time. And it's like, no, just rip the bandaid off. Get him in there Mm -hmm. and then just let him re, you know, adjust and get used to it at that point. It's really the kinder option is to kind of just get it done and over with like things like nail trimming. Like Mm -hmm. we had this dog come in that had very, very long nails and to no fault of the owner that he struggled with this dog for such a long time with vet visits. And the first day I was like, I'm doing these nails and he was not happy. Uh, He had to be muzzled. He was like, I hate this, but it needed to be done. Yep. So I could spend the whole month board and train, conditioning slowly and feeding treats. Or on his first day, I could hold his paws, make it clear that I'm not letting go and I'm not going to 
be permissive yep. and I can get his nails done and then I can spend the next month making sure those nails look great and that the whole process is able to be transferred to the owners. I'm curious because I'm thinking about a dog I just started lessons with a couple days ago. He's a lab that's already had three surgeries from eating foreign mm. objects and um we it's a previous client of mine she trained her dog with us before um and then this time with this dog she tried to do a lot of just positive only Mm -hmm. so she she came to us with her last dog who already had like very severe behavioral issues and reactivity so she did training with us right off the bat with her because it made the most sense but when she got this puppy she's like maybe Mm -hmm. I can just do it, you know, more force free and positive only. And then she inevitably hit the wall where she's like, okay, I have this like, you know, 70 pound lab Mm -hmm. who eats everything, drags me on a leash, Mm -hmm. um, fractured her elbow, like just insane. Right. And so she enrolled him in training here again. And the first day we took him out into the parking lot and we were using the e-collar to work on walking. And there was, have you guys seen that little crocheted singular booty out there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've left it there because it's kind of handy for yeah. dogs as a distraction. And we walked right over top of it and he immediately mm-hmm. went to ingest it. And I corrected him quite firmly mm-hmm. with the e-collar and he spit that out. Mm-hmm. And then he said, I Don't think I'm going to do that again. And we walked over a bunch more garbage and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And he said, what garbage? Yes. I don't see any garbage. And you could spend like months like walking past garbage and mark and reward and counter condition. Like he gets a treat when he sees garbage. But like, that's my question. Genuinely, I'm curious if there's any, anybody who knows or anybody who does like force free training that hears this what really are you guys doing to deal with dogs that have like obsessive compulsive, Mm -hmm. like ingesting behaviors because Pika. Yeah. Like what are you doing for that? That you think that is actually like long-term effective Mm -hmm. because are you just like extremely man, like managing the environment to where the dog has Mm -hmm. zero access to these things. Trash before your wall. Yeah. And then like what happened? Like I could see maybe in your own home, if you're just like hyper vigilant, Mm -hmm. um, maybe being successful until inevitably one day you leave the bathroom door open and your dog eats a tampon or something. Mm -hmm. But out in the real world, how do you work through that? Do you just have a treat in their face the whole time? What happens if the treat doesn't work? Mm -hmm. What happens if they already have it in their mouth? Then what are you doing? I'm just so curious yeah. because that behavior specifically to me is like so dangerous mm-hmm. and I can't imagine how you could effectively damage control that mm-hmm. using like a force freeway if yeah. it's happening. Yeah. I had those Arendelle Terriers. I was walking them and the puppy picked up a chicken bone and he yeah. was like, she was like, oh no, he is eating a chicken bone. <laughs> And I was like, well, I have a solution for you. And I just took our remote and I corrected him very firmly. And the chicken bone came flying out of his mouth. And she's like, he's never spat anything out before. And I was like, well, have you corrected him for it? And she's like, no, I didn't know Mm -hmm. I could. Mm -hmm. And then the puppy today I was working with Edgewater found a mayonnaise packet And he was like trying to eat the mayonnaise packet as fast as he could. And I was like, let me see your remote. And she was like trying to get to him so she could pull it out of his mouth. Yep. One correction, mayonnaise packet gone. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, Yeah, stuff like that. I'm always curious. I'm like, what are you? Oh, I just had somebody actually start training. Well, that was precious. He said, I can be precious again. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, just start training that fell victim to very odd uh, training advice for a while before she finally was like, I mm. need balance training. Like this is not working. Um, and it was so micromanaging. Mm-hmm. Like it everything is. about it was so micromanaging. Like she had this dog 
on the leash she had all of these they put in all these different knots of like this is Mm -hmm. where you hold the leash here and hold the leash here she was literally like this dog was choked up on the Mm -hmm. leash they only gave this dog like this much leash when it was around like distractions and stuff like that and they're like oh like when if the dog reacts you need to like do this pirouette move we were Mm. thank god this woman has a great sense of humor because we were cracking up in the lesson she's like Mm. they got me down here doing the damn cupid shuffle with this dog because like all of these different angles and turns and this and that and stuff and it's like our literal first lesson we had this dog walking around with lumos Mm. in the same room where she's like i have not been able to get this dog this close to another dog in over a year Mm -hmm. of doing these other techniques yes and it's just crazy to me that like yeah you prioritize like a little bit of discomfort on your dog's end because naturally we're not trying to hide that balance training or adversive methods are work because they're uncomfortable yeah they work because they don't feel good no and that's the whole point like people are like haha gotcha you use e-collars because they don't feel good i'm like yeah (laughs) I that's what punishment. we've been saying guys that's why it works yes why do you think people generally don't speed on the road because we don't like getting tickets yeah okay like positive punishment works mm-hmm. we don't like the experience of consequences that happen from certain behaviors yes. um we don't punch the person at the store in back of us that's being a jerk because we know that that's going to lead us with an assault charge mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. we may go to jail I mean, yeah. you could still punch them. Yeah. Um, but enjoy that the consequences. Yeah. yeah. And there's, and what's fascinating is that that owner of this dog, she pointed out to me. So when I took the dog, first time the dogs had a knee collar on again, we're doing, I'm working on correcting for the walking position. And, um, and to preface, like this dog understood heel, mm-hmm. like it knew what the expectations were. It just didn't care when another dog happened to be around yes. or distractions or whatever. So I'm correcting for an, a known command at that point with noncompliance. But what the woman said that was really striking to me was she was like, my dog looks more calm and relaxed when you're using an e-collar to create mm-hmm. these expectations than she ever looked when we were in situations where they're having me do all this Mm. ridiculous micromanaging around the other dogs. And I said, that's because your dog was freaking confused. Mm -hmm. It had no idea what it was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And now we're actually just clearly setting standards on, Hey, if you do really good, you get a treat. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do really good, you're going to get a correction. Yes. And the dog literally, it's like, you can see in those moments, the dogs just be like, Thank God. Somebody took like, the lead. Finally, someone's telling me mm-hmm. <laughs> what I should be doing right now. Yeah. It's like going to work and or like just being in your personal life and somebody doesn't tell you that they're mad at you mm-hmm. and you have to guess why they're mad at you. And you're like, what did I do? You're scanning your brain. And really, like, wouldn't you appreciate if somebody was like, I don't like it that you said this on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, you were fucked up for that. Just use your words. Yes. That's all I need from you. To use your words. Um, yeah. There's just certain things that I don't... I don't see the point mm-hmm. in making it take longer. And what's interesting... So, you know how... Did you see Ivan Balavanov did an actual, like, formal study mm-hmm. using punishment versus, like, mm-hmm. positive reinforcement in the context the peer of... peer-reviewed study? Did he get it peer-reviewed since that's so important to the people? Yeah, right. I don't know. Honestly, I haven't read it or anything. I just know what happened. But what's funny is that, of course, it was in the end result, it shows that balance training is more effective, mm-hmm. right? Obviously. Um, but what's funny is that now instead of people trying to say that positive only training or force free training is more effective, now they're changing their argument mm. altogether and they're saying, well, we never said it wasn't m- more effective because obviously we're just saying that it's more, um, the, the we care more about the welfare of the mm. dog. That like it's it's the, the welfare of the dog is what's more important, and that's why you shouldn't use punishment. Yes. What about the welfare of the human, or people outside of your house, or your kids that are getting 
beat up by your dog or mm-hmm. yourself that's getting beat up by your dog. Mm-hmm. Like, And say you take away using corrections for obedience and we just isolate it to nuisance behaviors. Mm-hmm. Try to make an argument with me. We'll go back to the eating things behavior. Mm-hmm. You will never be able to convince me that not correcting a dog for ingesting things that could kill it mm-hmm. is prioritizing their welfare. No. It's selfish. It is selfish. Because you don't want to utilize punishment and it works so well. So well. Um, I just don't understand. Gator, I don't want you to go back to have another surgery. Yes. I want you to live. And when they get those surgeries, sometimes some of their intestines are taken out and mm-hmm. the vet it sometimes is like, one more surgery and we're going to have to euthanize your dog. Yeah. They only have so much intestine to work with Mm -hmm. guys and you have to like, it damages it. It does. Um, but the going back to Caesar, we should call this episode Caesar Milan onto something. Um, (laughs) Is he onto something? Is he effective? He has a great sense of humor. He does. Like, his content now with his parrots and like <laughs> he's great. The dog psychology <laughs> center. Like I want to go there. Can you invite me there? Sees. I want to go see it. I want to see it. Have you ever seen him? Like when he like tours around and he Mm-mm. does his seminars. I went to go see him when he was in Canton one okay. time. He was at the what what theater is down there? I can't remember what it's called. But yeah, he did like a. I don't know. He was there and he had a bunch of dogs come and he worked with them while everybody was there. He's just hilarious. He is funny. Like he has a really, really good sense of Mm -hmm. humor. And I think that that also kind of helped. He's very charismatic. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped a lot when in those earlier days where he was being like very firm with dogs because Mm -hmm. like he had a way of like lightening the mood and these people would be like laughing at their Mm -hmm. own dogs as they're like pinned down (laughs) on the ground. Oh man. Um, new new that first episode, go and watch it. It's a it is a really good, interesting episode. Mm-hmm. But my dog Nelson, that was the exact like carbon copy of what he used to be like, <laughs> like when I first got him. And th- so that episode hit home for me. And I allowed that behavior to go on for <laughs> such a long time. And I watched Zach George video. Oh my gosh. And how far did that get you? Not far at all. Yeah, I'm not They're surprised. like, turn around and pivot, throw treats on the ground. Like when Nelson saw another dog, he was slipping out of harnesses, slipping out of collars. Uh, told the story, I'll tell it again. He got out of his harness one time, ran toward another dog. It flipped him in the air. And I remember like in slow motion watching his body fall out upside down from the air. And I was like, I have to do something about this because he's going to get himself killed. Mm -hmm. He was a nose biter. Anybody that came over to my house, if he was on the couch with me and they sat down, he was going for your face. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going for your hands. It was quite terrifying. Um, So when I got a pet corrector and e-collar, game changer. I don't ever use e-collar on him anymore, really. Like... I'll utilize like leash pops if that behavior reoccurs. Mm -hmm. But at this point, he's not interested in that behavior anymore. Yep. No, Snoop um, just recently. So our neighbors, one of our neighbors got another dog and he's like, who's that? Mm -hmm. You know, like when we're in the backyard, you know him, he gets some cage rage sometimes like barriers for him. And so I had him out in the yard and he wasn't wearing his e-collar and he was getting all sassy um and so i was like okay now we're back to e-collar on every time you go out Mm -hmm. and finally yesterday Mm. morning it's a good opportunity i nailed his little booty Mm because he was being such a jerk and here's the thing i do that for his own safety Mm -hmm. because the last thing i need is for him to antagonize a dog and that killed. is five times his size yeah. and then end up injured or dead because of it. Mm-hmm. And so it's not cute when your little dogs are have little man syndrome. And honestly, they don't have little man syndrome. They're doing it for a real reason. Okay. Mm-hmm. They don't have self-awareness. Snoop doesn't know how big he is. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know how big other dogs are. 
He does that because he's a little dick. And it feels good for him to do that. Yeah, he feels strong and powerful Mm -hmm. because he's telling you off. Most chihuahuas do it because they're scared. Mm -hmm. I know that he's not doing it because he's scared. A lot of chihuahuas will do it because they're scared. And that is, again, still something that should be corrected. Mm -hmm. And then you should look at ways that you are interacting with your chihuahua that is perpetuating Mm -hmm. them being this helpless, scared, little defenseless animal. Picking them up all the time. Mm -hmm. Never allowing them to like cope Mm -hmm. and learn with things and receive consequences just the way any other dog would. Yes. Like when he exhibited those behaviors and he got a very firm e-collar correction for it and he ran back over to me like, oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. did I pick him up and coddle him and hug him and kiss him? No. I ignored him. And I said, well, that's what you get. Sucks for you. Don't Mm -hmm. do that again. And people like probably would listen to this like force free people and be like oh my god they're so terrible (laughs) so heartless yes like (laughs) i love my dogs more than i love like anything in the world but i will punish my dogs for displaying behaviors that could hurt them or hurt other people Mm -hmm. and that's gonna take the center stage over me feeling bad for them yep like i had pizza um last night the dog pizza (laughs) at my house for dinner yes (laughs) I cooked him over the fire, um, <laughs> but he was in my backyard and my dogs know not to bark at the fence because we have neighbors on both sides and pizza saw a cat under the fence and he was chasing the cat <laughs> under the fence and okay, don't get triggered. I had, a, I have a crop Uh huh. and I cropped his booty and Kayla would have approved of this hundred yes. percent and yes. pizza was like, <laughs> And did he chase the cat after that? No. No. But he could not go be chasing cats out there. No, absolutely like, not. He was borderline trying to get under the fence. He couldn't have made it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry, pizza. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to, like, if I watch somebody else's dogs, they're going to adhere to the rules that I set in my house. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I would hope that other people would have that same thing with, if my dogs go to their house. Mm-hmm. That, that it, and that's what an interesting topic too of like people get so hung up on e-collars 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 and it's like <clears throat> it's not the it's not the e-collar it's the overarching concept of accountability mm-hmm. so like when i tell my clients like oh you need to eat, keep the e-collar on more consistently it's not because the e-collar is the end all be all it's that for most people the e-collar is the most convenient way Mm -hmm. that they will consistently give corrections for things but if you are able to enforce your rules and your expectations with other means of aversives or accountability Mm -hmm. it all is the same thing it's the same concept like it's not just the e-collar in that way i think the only time that i use e-collar with minnow is like if we're hiking and we're off leash Other than that, on our day-to-day, I never use it because Mm -hmm. I have other methods of controlling his behavior, and I'm not trying to do so. Snoop just farted. Oh. Where are you going? He said to see this Coke. Min Min, come here. (laughs) Come on. Come on. Oh no, he's triggered. Oh no, he's, he's triggered. Never, he's never gonna jump up on a couch. You better again. pick him up and help him. He is not gonna be able to do it again on his own, Bridget. Oh, amazing. He problem solved. What do you think? Snoop, do you have anything to add? He's got nothing. Well, Snoop. How he did said, it feel to be corrected the other day? Uh he said it sucked. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I'll be doing that again. Good. Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost like if you correct the behavior, then you don't have to correct for it anymore. Bingo. I, in uh, case in point, the one day he figured out that there was like a small little section of under our fence that was exposed because we have like a privacy fence, but it goes down a hill. So there's like, you know, those little tiny Mm -hmm. gaps And he thought he was so clever and cool and he figured out how to go underneath of it. Mm -hmm. And he ended up in the neighbor's yard one Mm -hmm. day. And as soon as I found out that was happening, we went outside 
what does he call her? And he said, wow, mom, look at this cool thing that I figured out. And yeah. he immediately went to the fence and went to go underneath. Yeah. He got a very firm correction. And he has never once tried to escape the yard yes. ever again. Dude. And again, that was for his own safety. Did you try to escape the yard? Minnow, did yeah, you? He did. <laughs> and he was gone for two hours. Minnow. At three in the morning. When did that happen? Uh, a couple of years ago. Mm. So I put him out in his Pikachu costume because it was around Halloween. <laughs> I said, just go take a pee in your Pikachu costume. <laughs> and then I like, I swear it was five minutes. Uh, but I went out and he wasn't out there anymore. And I was like, what the hell? Where is he? And I go on my front porch and his Pikachu costume is on my front porch. Just he derobed himself? Yes. So he escaped <laughs> under the fence and then tried to come to the front door to let me know that he was there. Oh my so gosh. So all I saw like was like a missing child finding their shoe. It was like <laughs> his little Pikachu costume. And my non-rational brain was like, somebody kidnapped him <laughs> and then took his costume off and put it on the front porch. And I was like absolutely hysterical like i could have gone into a mental hospital <laughs> my husband came home from work at two in the morning drove around and found him in somebody's garage <laughs> i you know he said that was the best day of my life and he got he had the audacity to have zoomies when he came back. oh my he god he doesn't house. know how serious this is no it's almost Sir. like you don't understand danger. Yeah, they don't. They have no sense of danger. Only in like a very like basic, low level, instinctual, primal way do they understand danger. They don't understand danger as it relates to the human world. No. And everything around it. It's funny, like, do you ever just watch your dogs interact with each other too? And just a natural punishment dogs do to one another. Yeah. Um, my husband and I were watching Minnow hump our female dog and i let it go because i just wanted to have them communicate and my female dog gets fed up like turns around grabs his neck and pins him to the ground <laughs> and my husband and i didn't move at all i wasn't scared no. i knew she wouldn't take it too far mm -hmm. and he was like on the ground and we were laughing at him a little mm -hmm. bit like yes i'm never gonna allow it to escalate to the point where anybody could get hurt yeah but he needed those natural consequences for humping her r routinely yes and she got fed up and she was like stop mm -hmm. but that's mean mm -hmm. she shouldn't have done that no it's, it hurt his feeling <laughs> And you think about it, that's essentially the same way that mm -hmm. Caesar dealt with the Chihuahua mm -hmm. and then I dealt with Finn, the dachshund, yeah. is that you're trying to bite me and do very inappropriate behaviors. And so I'm just going to wait until you decide to stop. Yes. Yeah. And show you that like that's not going to happen. I mean, just in the animal world, that was Sunday gave it was the most beautiful textbook correction. Like mm -hmm. she pinned him to the ground. She didn't keep biting him she just pinned him and she yep. was like stop yeah and he was like oh shit i mm -hmm. can't do that anymore that was like senny i think you were around when um atticus that one pit bull got that really good correction from sunny mm -hmm. uh, or not sunny uh, georgie georgie yeah. yeah so i had this really dominant pit bull that i was training um towards other dogs a little bit towards people but mainly towards other dogs and he would come out into a social and he would just full speed chest bump mm -hmm. and barrel through dogs and just <laughs> like that noise. Yeah. Like he never actually put his mouth on anyone, but he was just a complete dick mm -hmm. about it. And the one day we have, we have a livestock guardian dog and she gives the most beautiful mm -hmm. corrections to dogs like that so i put them together and he did his same bullshit where he comes flying out nailed her and she whipped around pinned him to the ground and stood mm -hmm. completely over top of him growling and snarling for a good probably like 40 seconds to even mm -hmm. a minute and he just laid there and he was completely still 
And he was like, holy crap. Mm -hmm. And that was such a huge turning point in his behavior with other dogs Mm -hmm. because he finally got his ass handed to him. And he said, oh, yeah, I guess I'm not the biggest, baddest dog on the block anymore. No, no. and in those cases, we allow dogs to correct one another. Obviously, we're not doing anything unsafe or like irresponsible. But in that moment, like, I remember I was there too. Like you did not react. You're like, well, <laughs> it's not like we're going to go grab the crop and get Georgie's remote and be like, bad girl. Yeah, no, she did exactly what I wanted her to do. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, like anytime you're dealing with dogs, there's always risk. Mm-hmm. You know, of course, there's always risk that somebody could get hurt or something could happen. But like you said, we know these dogs so deeply from how much time we spend with them how much training we've done with them that like I knew that Georgie was going to do exactly what Mm -hmm. that dog needed. And so that's why we chose to put them together. Um, So we mitigate as much risk as possible Mm -hmm. by making sure that we pick good pairings and things like that. Yes. Um, Any last thoughts about Caesar? Love him. Great. Do you think Caesar listens to our podcast? Um, yes. <laughs> he multi-million, million dollar man mm-hmm. yeah. spends time listening to our podcast. I think so. I think he's a low-key fan. Yeah. Um, tag him. If you're mm-hmm. watching this, tag Caesar. Hi, Caesar. Thanks for everything you did for the dog community. Yeah. He was the first one to make like oh, yeah. dog training like big. Mm-hmm. He changed the culture in that way yeah. of like people expecting more from their dogs and making their dog adjust to their lifestyle instead of just all of us. Because again, I think you remember too, like unless they were sport dogs or mm-hmm. used for working purposes, pet dogs growing up never left your house. Mm-mm. They stayed at your house and they stayed in your yard and that's it. And that was normal and whatever. Yeah. But Caesar like actually was the first to be like, no, take your dog on walks, take mm-hmm. them places, do things like with do them. things with them. And you can do that by making them adjust to fit your lifestyle yes. instead of just being at mercy to all of their behaviors. And explaining the psychology behind why dogs did the behaviors they did. That was huge during that time because mm-hmm. people were clueless. Like, why is my dog doing this? Yep. Um, so. Well, cool. Love you, C's. Thanks, buddy. Come here. Minnow, can you say... Comment down below. (laughs) Can you give us an... Oh my gosh. (laughs) And we'll end on that note. We'll end on that note. Bye.